In just a few days, I'm gonna be flying from New York down to Austin, Texas for the Knitting in the Hills retreat. I need to pack up, prepare for my classes, and along the way, I'm gonna be answering your questions from Instagram all about yarny events, knitting retreats, and conventions. So let's get our hair up and get this thing underway. Hey everyone, my name is Natalie, also known as Nitty Natty. I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Toaster. Today we are talking specifically about the Knitting in the Hills retreat, but also just about Yarny events in general. How much do they cost? What do they include? What kind of classes are there? How do I get to know people when I don't have any knitting friends IRL? Don't worry, I got you. I asked on Instagram what kinds of questions you all have about like knitting events, crochet events, yarny events in general. So let's just dive in with the first one. Where do you stay? What's the daily schedule? And how does this differ from classes at a wool festival? Okay, so let's start right there. I'm gonna make a distinction right now between a retreat and a festival slash convention. These are just my terms and how I define them. You can define them however it fits best for you. But when I think of retreat, I'm thinking of something that's a little bit smaller, a little more close knit, pun intended. It may be all inclusive where it includes classes, meals, and your stay, or it may be a little more a la carte, but generally it has like fewer teachers and you're all getting to know each other in some sort of social aspect. So Knitting in the Hills is a retreat that I'm going to and there's a limited number of attendees. So let's compare that to something that is a festival or more of a convention. These types of things are usually larger events and the main part of it may be the marketplace or the classes. There are tons and tons of teachers to choose from. You may not be seeing a lot of the other attendees regularly like you aren't in a small group, you may have like so many different people in so many different classes. So this is something that I would call a convention or a festival, very much like Vogue Knitting Live that I went to a few weeks ago and you can see that video right up here or maybe over here, I can never remember <laughs> which side it's going to be on. So just as a comparison, I'm gonna be talking about retreats and conventions and those are my two like terminology to distinguish between the two. The Knitting in the Hills retreat is a Thursday to Sunday event and it takes place at the Lakeway Resort and Spa, which is outside of Austin, Texas. It includes your accommodations at the resort hotel. It includes meals the entire time that you're there, three three-hour classes with the main instructors, plus a couple of other classes, it includes the marketplace, there's a small marketplace there, and then it also includes other events that is put on by the retreat. Let's take a look at the schedule. They are so organized with this Knitting in the Hills retreat. I went to this one other time back in 2020 and I made a vlog of my time there, so I'll definitely include that. Um, but they've been sending us pretty regular emails keeping us in the loop. I did sign up for this back in August of 2022, so it's been what, like, six months, I think, maybe seven months from the sign-up date to the um, actual event. So plenty of time to get organized. So of course I waited until I'm leaving in three days <laughs> to get every, everything prepared for my classes. But let's look at the um, draft schedule. I'm not gonna share this in full, but I will share a couple of things with you. So the event starts on Thursday. The ma majority of Thursday is all about getting registered and checking in. There's usually some type of swag bag and everything. And then there are some classes. I think I have a class, but we'll go over my full class schedule and what I'm taking when we start to prep for the classes here. There is a cocktail hour, a dinner, and a fashion show on Thursday. Then on Friday, we have breakfast, full day of classes, and just depending on what kind of schedule you choose for yourself, you may have two classes, you may have one class, you may have zero classes on these days. Again, we'll get to mine in just a second. We have lunch together and the marketplace opens. Um, there is also dinner and a game night. Then on Saturday, we're now into the third day of the retreat. We again have breakfast and lunch together. There's another cocktail hour, a dinner, and a presentation. And then on the last day, which is Sunday, it is a half day. Most people will go home on Sunday and fly out that day. We do have a brunch and kind of like a final remarks closing up thing. So 
That sounds really, really fun. I'm, I'm getting more and more excited about it. So the number one question that I got, I mean, literally multiple times is, how do you find out information on these retreats? So for me, I really find from word of mouth, maybe not necessarily from people I know, like face to face or in real life, but from following knitting podcasts, from following crocheters online, um, Instagram, YouTube, I also find that once I go to a specific event, I seem to like get into conversations with people to talk about other events that they've been to and just hear about it from word of mouth. Another strategy is that your local yarn store, if you are fortunate enough to live near one, or maybe you can sign up for newsletters for different ones, they will advertise these things, especially if they're related to the store. Knitting in the Hills is connected to Hill Country Weavers in Austin, Texas. So if you wanna get notified the next time that this retreat goes on sale, you can go to their website and sign up for their newsletter and make sure that you are always in the know about different happenings. There's one other amazing resource that I did not find myself. It was sent to me by one of you on Instagram. Thank you so much. It's a website that basically just lists in chronological order all of the different events happening around. Um, I think it's mostly in the United States, but I will have that website linked down below, kind of labeled as like resource for Yarny events. You can go check that out. I think you can also subscribe to a newsletter from them. And that way you can stay in the know about all of the happenings around the country. I am sitting here in front of my yarn and materials and tools because it is time to take a look into the classes that I have signed up for and see if I need to do any prepping of materials, any type of like knitting homework or anything like that, and just gather things together and have it ready for my trip. So there were a few questions here about classes that I want to make sure I answer while we do this. So the first question was, how exactly do knitting classes work and do you have to prep? So the knitting classes are kind of different depending on what you're like, what kind of retreat or what kind of convention that you're going to. For this one in particular, I believe we selected our classes when we signed up. There are a limited number of teachers because it is a smaller event. I think there were maybe like four main teachers who are the guest teachers who come in, um, who are people that are usually more well known um, in the knitting community. And you would get three classes with them for this uh, particular retreat. And then after everyone gets signed up, sometimes there are openings still in the class and you can kind of a la carte add things on. But for like the Vogue knitting one that I went to, there were, I don't know, a hundred teachers and there was so many different um, types of classes to sign up for. This retreat itself is more specifically for knitting. So there's a lot of knitting teachers here. So I do have to prep. I'm grabbing my computer because I have been sent an email for each of the classes that I am in um, with either the homework or the materials that I need. So let's just open up the first one. Um, this class is called Tailoring 101 and it is with Kate Oates. Um, so there is some homework. It looks like in this class, we are going to be kind of workshopping, um, customizing a sweater, which is really cool. I've been doing a lot of these customization classes, learning a lot about how to knit sweaters that actually fit me and fit me in the way that I want, not just in the way that they were designed. Um, so it looks like I, need to start a swatch. I need some DK or worsted weight yarn and I have instructions to cast on 25 stitches, knit six rows and garter stitch, don't break the yarn, don't bind off and just set it aside. So that's going to be pretty easy. Um, I also see that I'm going to need like pencil paper, calculator, a tape measure, basic knitting tools, which is something that I would definitely bring to all of my classes anyway. While I'm getting things squeaky pulled out here for this first class, I see a question that says, do classes come with materials or do you have to bring your own? I have never gone to a class, maybe I shouldn't say never, rarely do the classes provide materials for you. Sometimes they will and it will be in the description and it will be included in the cost of the class. But for most classes, you'll bring your own needles, yarn, like knitting accessories and things like that. However, if the class does involve a pattern, that's typically included in the class fee. So for this class with Kate Oates, we're gonna be looking over a sweater pattern and that part is included in there. 
This is a great question. If you have homework for a class, what yarn do you use if you have stashed down? <laughs> so many of you know that I have mostly eliminated my stash. I'm still working through a lot of my mini skeins, and of course I'm still adding the stash, um, but I don't really have a lot of yarn that is not already designated to be something else, and I don't really want to crack into like a fresh skein of yarn or just buy a fresh skein of yarn um, for a class because I don't really like to start new projects in classes. I just like to take them as is, learn the techniques, and then let go of that yarn or reuse it, unwind it later. So I do have quite a few um, skeins of DK weight acrylic yarn that I have held on to because they are really good for tutorials. I mostly knit with fingering weight yarn and crochet with fingering weight yarn. That can be hard to see <laughs> when I'm filming. So I do have quite a few things here. I think this is what I'm gonna use for my tailoring class, because again, I'm not looking to actually start a sweater. I just wanna learn the technique. So I'll probably just pick one of these and grab some needles and start that swatch, put it in a bag and call it a day. But behind door number one, <laughs> I also have a ton, and I mean ton, of fingering weight scraps. So I think it's time to look and see what I need for my next class. I'm just gonna close this so you don't have to look at my socks and underwear <laughs> while we're talking. Okay, so my second of three classes is called Mighty Remnants with Dawn Barker. Um, the description is somewhere in here if I click through the links. I can't remember exactly what we're gonna be doing, but I know we're talking about like how to use leftovers, which is, Perfect for scrap three, scrap free 2023. Can't even say my own <laughs> hashtag correctly. So there's no homework for this class. Homework means that you have to do some type of like knitting or crochet prep before the class or like prepare materials in some other way. So I love a class with no homework, but I do have some materials. It says, bring your scrap stash and a tapestry needle and learn how to apply basic color theory to breathe new life into your precious remnants. I forgot this one's about color theory. So am I going to bring my entire scrap stash from New York to Texas? Probably not, but I think what I'll do is maybe sort through here and just bring a lot of the different solid colors or maybe some of my favorite colors and limit myself to like a gallon size Ziploc bag because I think that will be enough to play with. Figure while we're uh, sorting through these, I would answer a couple more questions. This one says, how much time do you give yourself to prep homework for classes? And then another one says, is there a lot of prep before attending classes and how interactive are there? So it really depends. There's not always a ton of prep um, for classes. I tend to pick classes that are not super involved because I've just done a lot of classes in the past and I find that project-based classes where you're actually working on a specific pattern, you're starting a project, are things that I don't enjoy as much. Like I don't go home excited to work on the project. I just feel like I've added another like month long task <laughs> to my to-do list. So I tend to pick classes that are more lecture style or more skill-based and they're teaching a specific technique. As far as how interactive the classes go, um, it really depends on the teacher. These classes at the Hill Country Weavers Retreat tend to be on the smaller side, probably like when I went last, I think there was probably 20 people or less in there, which is really, really nice. I think that that's with adults, you know, it's plenty of, um, you get plenty of attention from the teacher that way and it's really, really great. And actually my classes at Vogue were pretty small too. So I felt like they were very interactive. I could ask lots of questions, but that totally depends on the teacher. Now, how much time should you give yourself to prep? probably more <laughs> than I have given myself. I think I'm going to be lucky here. My last class that we need to look at the homework with actually has the most amount of prep with it, but I think I found a workaround for that one. I ended up with a pretty good amount of scraps. I decided against using the Ziploc bag because why waste one of those? I've been looking for an excuse to start using my beautiful new Hohe bag from Vogue Knitting Live. So that class is all ready to go. So I have one class left that I need to prep for. This class is called Knitwear Embroidery with Caitlin Hunter. It says we will learn to add special touches to our knit projects with embroidery. Sounds very interesting. Now, I like to be really resourceful and I don't wanna work 
too, too hard, especially because I don't want to create all these brand new projects for me. And just remember that when you're going to these classes, it's not like high school. You're not getting a grade. You're there for you. So please don't like stress yourself out by doing too much for the class. Again, though, if that's your personality, like go for it. It used to be mine, but now I'm like so much more relaxed about these things. So let me tell you how I'm hacking <laughs> this class here, especially when you're traveling and you have a limited amount of space in a suitcase. You don't want to have to bring multiple things. If things can work within the multiple classes, make them work. So here's what I'm here's what I'm getting at. For this class, it says a knit item to practice embroidery on is needed. It can be hand knit or store bought. Um, a swatch of at least eight by eight inches would work well. Solid color stockinette is easiest to practice on. Then of course, a darning needle and scissors and scrap yarn in various colors to use for embroidery. So I'm thinking I don't want to knit a brand new eight by eight swatch to practice embroidery on. That's not me. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not spending our precious knitting hours on making a swatch for embroidery. If I needed to, I would. But I have a lovely little project here that is definitely going to be coming with me on the retreat because I'm going to need some projects to work on. That'll be our next segment, actually. And what do you see here? I see lots and lots of beautiful stockinette stitch that's smooth and light colored and would be lovely to embroider on. I don't think I'm going to mess this up by embroidering on it and then taking it out. So here we go. Swatch is complete. And as far as my little uh, colorful scraps go, I seem to remember that I have packed up a bunch of different colored yarns for my other class. So that's it. I'm ready for my classes. I've got my scraps in one bucket. I put my skein of yarn for my tailoring class and I just need to add some needles. And then I'll be using this project as the basis for my embroidery class. Class is prepared. Check. This brings us to the age old question of how do you decide what types of projects to pack and how many? So many of you ask this question. I always take more projects than I could ever finish, but I like it. What about you? Okay, so this is something that I actually spend a lot more time thinking about than preparing for my classes <laughs> because the classes are gonna happen and then they're gonna be done and that's it. But my projects are something that I started before, during, and continue after. And we're always thinking about our knitting and crochet projects. So how do you decide? How do you bring enough to make sure that you have everything you need for all the different activities, but how do you not overpack and kind of like take up precious space in your suitcase, especially if you're traveling by plane? So I've got with me um, my two current whips, my sock that I'm working on as a design, and the sweater that I showed earlier that is also gonna act as a swatch for one of my classes. So I like to think about what am I gonna be doing during the time that I'm away? So I'm gonna be gone for actually one full week. We're gonna be flying out ahead of time, spending a few days in Austin. I have a brother that lives there, so we're gonna to get to hang out with him a little bit, explore the town, and then I'm gonna have four days of the retreat. There's gonna be classes, there's gonna be events, but there's also going to be quite a bit of downtime where we're gathered with other knitters. Every retreat I've ever been to has a space where there's either tables or couches, or sometimes people will just gather in the lobby like they did at Vogue. They also had tables at Vogue, but definitely for this retreat, there's typically a room that is reserved. It's not a classroom. It's just open with tables so people can gather around and knit. So I want to have one like larger project that's not too difficult, but that I have plenty of knitting on it so that I can work on it in the evenings while I'm flying on the airplane, while we're hanging out in the hotel room. And then I also want a smaller project that is good for like during the dinners and the lunches that I don't have to have something huge in my lap, especially because my main project is a cream colored sweater. I may not want to bring that with me to meals, but it'll be perfect to work on like in the evenings and stuff. So I think way more about this and getting my projects into a place where they're going to be easy enough to work on. And then also thinking ahead in the pattern of things that I might need. Okay. So my first project is my sweater. I'm probably just going to be bring these two projects, but then I have one other, little secret that I'll share in a second. So 
This sweater still has a lot of knitting left on it. It would be amazing if I could get a ton of this done <laughs> over the week that I'm away. So I have about 15 inches of body and hem that are just plain, 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 easy knitting. However, I do need to wind up these two skeins to have them ready to go. So that's gonna go on my to-do list to do before I leave. I've got a few days. I probably will maybe start one here in just a second. I also need to think ahead to the sleeves and what kind of needles do I need for the sleeves? Do I need stitch holders? Do I need longer needles? And I need to get those prepped and I need to get them in this bag and ready and then see if I need any markers, anything like that. I wanna have everything I need for this pattern ready to go. So that's gonna be the main project. My secondary project are these socks. I wanna make sure I have both needles ready to go. I've already got my yarn wound, so this one's gonna be an easy one. What's trickier about this is that it's a design, so I need to think through some of the harder parts first, like I need to finish working with a second needle size to see if that works better, and then rip back to my starting points. And anyway, that doesn't need to be discussed here, but I need to get this into a place where it's just easy knitting ready to go. This is gonna be a perfect project for working on the plane, perfect for dinners, perfect for being in the car, perfect for being out and about. And I don't have very much knitted, so I think that's going to definitely last me. But then, even though this is surely enough knitting for one week, even if I complete the sweater and the socks, which probably won't happen, what about if one of these projects goes badly? What if a needle breaks? Well, if a needle breaks, I can just buy one since I'll be at a retreat. <laughs> but what if like, it's just not working out or I'm not enjoying it or I've forgotten something? You need to have an emergency backup skein. On nearly every trip I've ever been on, I like to bring with me a single skein of sock yarn for my emergency backup. I will also bring with me a set of needles to start a project if catastrophe happens. <laughs> Maybe that's a little bit dramatic, but what if my sweater, I run out of yarn? What if something happens? What if I break a needle and I just can't repair it? I like to have this ready to go. This can be for me many different things, but mainly it's gonna be either a pair of socks or a muscle burrow hat. So I think for this one, I'm definitely wanting to make a muscle burrow. Isn't that a fun color? Super, super pretty. This is actually a custom dyed skein for the Love and Stitches membership that the Little Wolf Knits did. It was a really cool event. So I think, yeah, that's gonna make a really, really cute muscle burrow hat. I'm obsessed with them. So this skein is gonna get wound up for emergencies. I was gonna cast it on as a muscle burrow eventually anyway, so this is fine to go ahead and just have it caked and ready to go. I'm also gonna grab the needles and again, just throw everything into a project bag. It will probably just sit in my suitcase, but it's so nice to have it there just in case. I need to get these three pretties wound up, so I figured might as well get started on that right now. And while I'm doing that, I can answer a few more questions. So this one says, have you ever been to one, being a retreat by yourself? If so, how is that experience? And do you get anxious about going to knitting retreats alone? So I actually have been to a retreat by myself. Most of the time I go with a friend, like a knitting friend that I already know, um, but I actually kind of like going to them by myself. Hang on, loud noises as I get all these things <laughs> that cover up my uh, Swift. Okay, here he is. Um, so I kind of like going to the knitting retreat by myself where I like don't have another person that I specifically went there with. Maybe I do know some people there. I think it's kind of fun when you don't know anybody because you really get to meet new people. Sometimes when you go already with a group of people, it, not in a bad way, but it kind of closes you off from getting to know other people. So when I go alone, I find that I'm way more social and I like meet way more people. And then since I've been going to a lot with like one group of friends or one friend or a group of friends, I really try to look out for people that are there alone and invite them to come to sit with us, to knit with us. Hey, we're gonna be like meeting downstairs later at five o'clock if you wanna come. So if you're going alone, don't be shy about going up to other people at their table, whether it's at a meal or sitting and knitting at night, 
people want to meet you. They are there to be social, to meet people, to take the classes, sure. Um, but I think that one of the special things about retreats specifically is that you get to meet new, new people. So don't be shy, just go up. Hey, is anyone sitting here? Can I sit here and knit with you? Um, and then, you know, icebreaker is always like, what are you working on? <laughs> I feel like everyone loves to talk about what they're working on. So that works perfect. And if you do go with friends, try not to close yourself off. I know it's hard to do because you're so excited to see your friends. Sometimes it's friends that live across the country and you're really excited, but try to look out for people that are there alone and invite them to sit with you. I've never been, largely because I don't have any IRL in real life, knitting friends, tips for breaking the ice, and another question, advice on making friends and not sitting in the corner <laughs> like a complete loner. Okay, I guess I kind of already got into that one a little bit, but seriously, please don't hesitate to go up to other knitters while you're on these retreats. If people are rude to you, boo on them. Not getting to meet you, I think that's just terrible, but I will say most people are really sweet at these different events. One of the best ways I find to make friends at these places are in the classes. So try to be a little talkative. I mean, obviously not over the teacher in the class, but try to get to know the person next to you. And I also think it's okay to say, oh, here I am putting this on the wrong way. <laughs> I think it's okay to say like, hey, I'm here um, alone. I haven't come with any friends. And if you share that with people, I think they're going to be even more likely to kind of look out for you. I think you can always kind of tell like the people who are going to be nice, to be honest, like not from what they look like per se, but with your interactions with them. So if you start talking to somebody and they, they don't seem like they're going to invite you <laughs> to sit with them, just whatever, it's their loss. Um, but I would really, really encourage you to go to a retreat, whether alone or with people. One other thing I have for you, and this doesn't apply to every single retreat because I don't think this is happening for the knitting in the hills, but I may be wrong about that. Let's get one of these wound up. But some retreats will actually have some kind of message board or maybe even a make along before the retreat begins. So that would be a really great way to start to get to know people who are going to be there. So you may not have met in person, but you may know them by name and you can find them at the retreat. And that's always a lot of fun. My best icebreaker questions are what are you knitting on? Where are you from? Have you been to this retreat before? So have a couple of those questions tucked in your back pocket and ready to go. Can you hear that? <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it on the camera, but we're winding up the first skein of yarn. Okay, so this next one says, as an introvert, do you find knitting retreats overwhelming? So I am definitely an introvert. I need to be alone to recharge. I love, love, love going to these social events, but it definitely drains me. It doesn't mean I don't want to be there in the moment. I want to make that really, really clear that I love it so much and I'm so happy and I can kind of be more social and extroverted for a little while, but then I need to go recharge. So it definitely does drain me, I think more than someone who's more extroverted and who feeds off the energy of being around other people. So here are some tips <laughs> that may help you. I would say having your own room is pretty big. Usually having your own room is a little more expensive. Um, well, kind of a lot more expensive, but in the scheme of like how much a retreat costs, it's not a huge percentage. So this is gonna be the first time that I actually have my own room. Kent is coming with me, <laughs> but I'm not sharing a room with another attendee. Um, we'll speak a little bit more about that in a second. I did get a question on roommates. But I think having your own room or your own space to go to is really, really important. Even when I've gone with a roommate, we really worked out like, you know, having some time alone. I actually spoke with her. We were good friends already, but I did tell her ahead of time, like, hey, I'm probably going to need some time to like unwind and go to the room. So if that happens, I'm not mad. I'm not upset. I just need a little time away. So having that is actually really, really great. And I do find that retreats when you're there all day, it's a little different than a convention. Here's my comparison that may not be very helpful for everybody, but let's say that you are a Disney World fan and you have a one day ticket to Disney World. You're gonna be there when the park opens, you're gonna stay until fireworks, you're gonna be there all day long because you wanna take advantage of that one day that you have and that ticket that you paid. 
But what about if you have a pass and you're there for seven days? You're not gonna be as worried about getting everything packed into one day. You're gonna have a few activities on one day. Let's go home in the middle of the day. It's fine. We already, we already paid the set amount. We're here the whole time anyway. Is that getting loud? <laughs> so I feel like retreats are kind of like that pass. You're already paid for. You're there for the whole entire time. If you need to go back to your room and take a little time, if you need to skip class, <laughs> I mean, you do what works best for you. I also find that I like to bring my like own comfort items. Like I always bring my slippers, which are, I got some new ones, but I'm still wearing my old and gross ones. <laughs> I like to bring my slippers. I like to bring myself some snacks. I, I just like to have some different things that remind me of home and make me feel comfortable so that as an introvert, I can still go to my space, get refreshed, and then come back to the classes, come back to the evening and spend more time with others. All right, we got one skein wound up. I think I'm gonna put it in, in here. Let me start another one. This one was kind of interesting. It says, what if you are a picky eater? Okay, so that can definitely be a challenge. Uh-oh, hold on. <laughs> the way the <laughs> Swift is getting um, caught in the uh, tripod here. Oh, now it's getting caught with my slippers. All right, get it together, Natalie. Try to act like a professional here. <laughs> okay, so if you're a picky eater, I know that can be very tricky. So first of all, for retreats that do provide food, they are usually very accommodating about dietary restrictions. So if you have anything like specific gluten-free or maybe you're a vegetarian, I mean, to the best of their ability, they're usually already working with a larger company like this one's at a resort that can accommodate those things. If you have some preferences maybe that can be accommodated, I would just say reach out well ahead of time and just try to be understanding if those can't be accommodated, if they're only able to do accommodations for allergies and things. I mean, maybe <laughs> maybe you can frame it as an allergy, I don't know. But I totally feel for you. So something that I like to do because I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a hugely picky eater, but I sometimes don't like the food that's there. Most of the time it's actually really good, but I like to have snacks in my room. That way I also can eat anytime I'm hungry. I hate being hungry and not being able to eat, um, but they do feed us well at Knitting in the Hills. And then some retreats actually don't include food. So you're totally on your own for food, which can be a good thing and a bad thing. It's kind of nice just to have everything right there where you need it, but it's also nice to be able to make your own plans, have your own budget, um, choose your own things that you like to eat. And those kinds of retreats may be closer to like a city center. This one, Knitting in the Hills, is a little out of the way. There's not as much around it that you could actually get food from without a car or anything, but like Vogue Knitting Live is in the middle of New York City, <laughs> right in Manhattan. You could walk to pretty much any type of cuisine that you wanted to get. So just kind of um, take those things into consideration. I would say always have snacks, reach out ahead of time if you can, and then try to map out the area so you can know what to expect. Throwing my last skein here on the winder and I have one more interesting question to share. Is it only purely knitting or are pure crocheters also welcome or a target audience? And I think the meaning of that would be like people who don't knit at all who just crochet. Okay, so I will preface this by saying that I am primarily a knitter. Come on, yarn. What are you doing, yarn? <laughs> the beginning of it's always wild. Okay. I am primarily a knitter and that means the people that I follow, the accounts I have on Instagram and on YouTube are pretty much knitting. So I feel like my circle, my, um, the algorithm or whatever, like targets me as a knitter with knitting things. So most of what I know is knitting retreats and knitting in the hills is definitely more of a knitting retreat. The way that you can tell is by looking at the teachers. What do the teachers do? Are they designers for knitwear or crochet? Do they teach crochet techniques or knitting techniques? A lot of teachers do both, um, but what kinds of classes are they offering specifically at this retreat? So Knitting in the Hills is all knitting. You're gonna see primarily knitters there. There will be people that do crochet, but I would be surprised if there's anyone there that only crochets. 
Vogue though was definitely more of a maybe 60-40 or 75-25 kind of a split. There was quite a few crochet classes. There was lots of people that did both, both crafts and there were people who were um, primarily crocheters there. There are events that are for crocheters but again I don't think that they're like entering my my realm be, just because I'm not a crocheter primarily. Um, one that comes to mind though is Our Maker Life. I'm not sure if that one's still going on but I know there that was a really big event for crocheters. So some ways to find out about those types of events is just follow your favorite crocheters. Um, TL Yarn Crafts, Tony Blipsy comes to mind, Coco Crochet Lee. I think both of them have been at Our Maker Life um, by Stephanie Aaron is one of my favorite crochet designers. So whoever you're in the world with, whoever you're following, um, maybe the best people to find out about those types of events. There are probably more knitting retreats out there right now, but hey, let's make more crochet ones. I think we need more crochet in this world. I'm crouched down here in front of my finished objects drawer because it's time for the last category here, which is clothes and knitwear. You're going to a knitting or crochet retreat and it's the perfect time to show off those things that you've made because you're in a place where people are going to appreciate them the most. So there's a couple of things I like to consider whenever I'm packing for a trip. And the first is the weather. So I have pulled up Austin's weather here on my weather app on my phone. And it looks like in the time that we're going to be there, it is going to be pretty warm. I can't quite see through the next weekend yet because we're still a ways out, but some of the days are getting up to 80 degrees, but they're starting the day in the 50s. Also keeping in mind that the classes are gonna be inside and in Texas where it is hot most of the time, that air conditioning is usually blasting. So I'll kind of keep that in mind. My typical uniform is jeans and comfortable shoes and some kind of a knitting top. So I'm going to be getting into my short sleeves here, but I also need to consider the bags that I'm bringing. So on this trip, we're going to be flying and we are going to be um, taking the train to and from the airport. So I have to be really mindful about how many bags that I bring. It's a lot easier to have fewer bags to manage and carry. So what that looks like for me is I'm going to have my large suitcase that's a rolling suitcase i'm going to need to fit all of my clothes toiletries and all of my class knitting items and extra projects in there i will have a small backpack which is mostly going to be filled with my computer technology because we're going to be filming and then a project for the plane and then i will also have my little sling back i don't know what these things are called it's a little bag it, i can wear it as a purse and still have my backpack on which is very important for me especially going through the airport and stuff it's also small enough that once i get to the retreat and i'm not really needing to grab my purse i'm not going to be purchasing a lot of things i can just throw that into my other knitting bag one of the concerns that i saw was how do i not overpack and for me that really mostly happens in the knitting stuff so hopefully i've showed you some strategies that i like to think through so that i don't bring too much for my classes or too many projects but i still have enough for just in case as far as clothes go, I don't know, I'm kind of like a one outfit per day kind of a person, but at knitting retreats, typically I will change sometime in the evening into something a little more comfortable. So I don't have a lot of clothes to begin with. I'm probably going to be bringing most of my clothes for this trip, but I want to start with the knitwear and that's all I'm really going to show because that's the most exciting part. So let's dig through here. I'm going to find a few short sleeve tops that I want to bring. I got myself down to six knitting pieces. And I kind of started by saying, okay, I'm going to be at this retreat for four days. That's one top per day. Plus I want to have some kind of cardigan, maybe a shawl in case I get cold. So let me show you what I got. All these projects will be linked down below, but this is my lace and fade boxy, which I feel like will be nice and cool. Plus I just finished it. So kind of want to bring it. Um, this one, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name right now, but I'll have it linked. It's one of my favorites from Wool and Pine Designs. I just can't remember what it's called. This one is a Tanya by Caitlin Hunter, who is one of the teachers there. I think it's always fun to wear patterns from the teachers if you have them. And then I was kind of debating between this um, prismatic sweater or my 
uh, uh, what's the other one called? Summer Sorrel. But I decided I like this one on me a little bit better. So all four of these tops I can just wear with jeans, super easy. And they all kind of have a little bit of pink in them, of course. So I'm also going to bring my like a cloud cardigan, which is knit out of Shibui yarn. And Shibui is going to be there for like one final hurrah, which will be cool. And then I realized when I was at the Vogue um, classes, I was getting kind of chilly and I wish I'd had a shawl. So I'm bringing this beautiful shawl, which I knit a long time ago and don't really remember much about, but I think it will go with all of my different outfits. I'm gonna sit here and get these things folded up, um, but I like to do this a few days ahead of time because that way, if anything needs to be washed, I can go ahead and wash it. And now I also have everything set aside for me so I know what not to touch and not to wear. I may also put a couple of like shorty socks in there, um, hand knit shorty socks. I'm looking at my socks right now, maybe, it might be too hot. I might wanna wear sandals. Oh my gosh, it just looks like it's snowing outside. <laughs> it's snowing here and it's gonna be 80 degrees in Texas. I need to paint my toenails. Okay, I had one other question about packing that I wanted to answer. Other than assigned materials, what should I make sure I have? Okay, so things we already talked about, projects to work on. There's usually gonna be some downtime at night. You wanna have a nice, easy project so you can talk with people, but still like work on your projects because that's what everyone's gonna be doing, which is so much fun. Um, knitwear to wear and of course kind of show off. Make sure you know the names of your patterns <laughs> or that you can find them on Ravelry. That's pretty easy to do. I would say snacks are a big one. Even if you don't have any dietary restrictions, it's just nice, like if you get hungry late at night to not have to go purchase something really expensive at a hotel, um, but to just go ahead and have your snacks with you. We love those Target brand, what is it like, good in something, um, that have all the little trail mixes. So we're gonna stock up on a few of those to have on the plane and in the hotel room while we're there. I also like to have a larger like tote kind of a bag. I'll probably pack it flat in my big suitcase, but something that's a little bit bigger that I can take with me to class that has all my materials, my knitting projects, my purse stuff, a water bottle, that's a big one too. So that I don't have to run back and forth to my room like between classes or between meals, but I can just have everything with me all at once. One more thing, make sure you have comfortable clothes for the evenings when you're sitting and knitting. It feels so good to take off your hand knit sweater and your jeans, put on some stretchy pants and knit with everyone at the end of the day. Someone said, I would love to see if your packing strategy has changed since your last uh, Hills Retreat packing video. So it is Sunday afternoon and I am about to start packing for the retreat, which I leave on Thursday morning. I don't know, I would like to say I'm getting better about not overpacking, but you can watch the video and determine that for yourself. As we start to wrap up, I have a couple more questions I wanna hit, definitely on the cost, but also this question. How do you pick which ones to go to? So it definitely depends on what you are looking for. Are you looking for a specific teacher? Teachers that teach knitting and crochet courses may travel around the country and you can maybe even follow them to find retreats and see where they are teaching. So that might be a pull for you. That's usually a pretty big draw for a lot of these retreats. Uh, one of the factors could be location. It's definitely a whole lot cheaper to go to a retreat that is in a drivable distance. I mean, I guess that depends. If you don't have a car like us, it isn't really a factor. <laughs> it's okay to fly. Um, but like, you know, Maybe it's time of year, maybe it's location. There's so many different reasons to pick one retreat over the other. Um, it may also be costs, which we'll talk about in a second, but I would say generally most of the retreats are gonna cost around the same thing. I mean, some definitely, if they're in a nicer location, have more classes, have food included, are gonna be a higher price than the ones that are more a la carte. So all of those factors may play into things, but I would not book a retreat that doesn't have details on all of these things on the website um, unless you personally like know like hey it's your local yarn store and they're like putting together a retreat and like you can talk to somebody in person i have not heard of anyone ever getting like i don't know not like surprise i guess when they got there but just in case i want you to you know feel that your money is going to a good and valuable thing and you know everything that you're getting up front. I feel like that always helps, especially when putting 
towards a pretty large amount of money towards something. So with that, let's talk about cost. I got a few questions about cost that I am going to make sure I answer. Um, the first one just said, let's see, um, what is the average cost of most knitting retreats that you have gone to? How expensive are they, generally speaking? And then um, are retreats expensive and do you have to share a room with a stranger? So I don't know if there's like an average cost. I've actually only been to this Knitting in the Hills retreat and then one other retreat in Texas that was a little bit smaller scale. It wasn't at a resort hotel, more of just a, you know, your basic level hotel. So those are the only ones I really have to compare to, but I've looked online at lots and lots of different retreats. So I would say, and take a deep breath with me, generally retreats are gonna cost somewhere in the couple thousand dollars. Before you click away, <laughs> let me tell you a little bit more about what that means. So this retreat specifically cost $2,095. That was for a single room. If you do not have a single room, if you opt to have a roommate, um, it is a few hundred dollars cheaper. Um, so that include room for room and board. <laughs> it's not a college, but it includes the hotel room for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. It includes three three-hour classes, which alone would be several hundred dollars. It includes um, the other events that we're going to have, like the cocktail hours and the um, fashion show and stuff like that. It includes um, meals, which is huge. The whole time that you're there, it includes meals, which is great. Um, and usually there's some kind of goodie bag. And then also the retreat itself is like a social event, which is value too. Um, so I would say it more than meets the value, but of course that's a pretty expensive um, thing to go to. This retreat did offer payment plans. Like I said, I signed up back in August, so it's been six, seven months, and you could choose to pay in installments. I'm not sure every retreat is gonna be that way, but it may be. Now, for comparison, I'm going to another retreat later in the summer, and it is totally different. The price for the retreat itself was like less than $300. However, I had to book my own hotel, so there's the cost. None of the food is included, so I'm gonna have to budget that in. Um, there aren't any classes, so I'm not getting that value. And so there's different, you know, different kinds of retreats that you can go to. I'm still really excited about this one and it's going to be a lot of like community stuff. So I'm looking forward to that a lot. Other things you're going to want to factor in aside from just the retreat cost. So let's look specifically at this trip. We've already paid for, and I say we, cause Kent's coming with me, but this is all just stuff that I get. I mean, he gets to go in the hotel room, but whatever. So I have my hotel, I have my food just for me, I have um, all the fun like knitting things, the classes, all that, the community. Then we had to get there. So this time we are of course flying from New York. We were pretty fortunate to get some flights. I think it's $500 total round trip for the two of us because we are scrappy and we are going to be going on early flights and flights that aren't the greatest. <laughs> so we're willing to do that in order to save some money. Um, you also might want to consider a rental car. This time we are going with friends, so that is going to be a shared cost. Um, and then what other things do you want to consider? If it doesn't include food, include food. I think that we're pretty much set other than that. Getting to and from the airport, sometimes retreats will actually include a shuttle for you. Um, sometimes you're gonna be responsible for your own transportation and Uber. So just think about all of the things. And if you can plan ahead, then you can do some saving in advance in order to enjoy a weekend like this. As far as the roommate thing goes, it definitely saves you money to share a room. And for this retreat, specifically, you could go ahead and select a roommate ahead of time. So when I went with my friend Rebecca a few years ago, we knew we were going together. We knew we wanted to room together. And when we signed up for the retreat, we just put each other's names in. They put us in a room together and it was great. If you don't know you want to like who you want to room with, there are also options. I think I saw that on the form this year that you could say, hey, I do want to have a roommate, but I haven't picked anyone. And then you'll be paired with somebody. So it's a little bit of a risk but I feel like when you're both there for the same thing that you're gonna have no problem really sharing that space. This person said, I think a video regarding knitting retreats you have been to 
or know about would be fun. Well, I have some good news for you. I do already have a few videos about different events that I've been to just off the top of my head. I've got Rhinebeck from last year. I have DFW Fiberfest from last year. Both of those would fall into the category of a festival. I have Knitting in the Hills retreat from 2020. I think that's the only like true retreat I have. And then I just went to Vogue Knitting Live in New York City. I'll make sure to put a playlist down below. So if you liked this video, well, actually that video will be totally different. Those videos are more vlogs about the actual events, but if you're interested in hearing more, you can follow that playlist and see a few more events that I have been to. Last one here, one of you said, I would rather see a vlog about the retreat than watching a prep video. So I have good news for you. Coming up next, I am going to have a vlog about the Knitting in the Hills retreat. Actually, as you're watching this, I am in Austin right now. So if you want to get a little bit of a sneak peek, make sure you're following me on Instagram at Knitty Natty. And sometime in a few days after the retreat is over, I will have the vlog showing you exactly how all my classes went, all of the different things that were involved there and the time that we had in Austin. Now, just in case you're watching this before the retreat actually happens and you live in the Austin area, you can get a day pass from Hill Country Weavers on their website. So I will leave the link down below. I think it's for Saturday and it's $15 and you can go in and enjoy the marketplace. I remember it being amazing in 2020. So I'm very excited to see what vendors they have this year. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you were able to take away a little nugget um, to help you decide if you want to go on a knitting or crochet retreat. I could not recommend it more and I will continue to share all the things that I go to with you so that you can continue to learn about the different places and maybe see where you wanna go next. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.